Three years ago, I tried Tinder for the first time. I was 25 at the time, and while most 25-year-old women have dabbled on Tinder or the like, I hadn't been single since I was 17. I met my ex while I was in high school. Six years later, we got married, had a baby. I was happy. But those last couple of years together, he had really begun to resent me and the family that we had created together. I fought to keep our relationship together, but the abuse became more frequent and more intense. It got to the point where I took our baby and flooded the house in the middle of the night. My mind was scarred and my heart was raw. It was a really difficult time in my life. A couple of months after I left, I had a new home, a new job, and a renewed sense of life. I was starting to open up and I could feel myself healing. I was, however, lonely. I was adjusting to shared custody and I spent my weekends alone. I didn't want to jump into a relationship, but I did want to experience some of the things my eight-year relationship hadn't allowed me. So, joining Tinder felt fun. It was new and scary, and after so much drama, it felt nice to have so much positive attention. My self-worth was low, so the cheap compliments and instant gratification of the app felt incredible. Who am I to deserve their attention? Why would they choose to speak to me, of all women? Not my healthiest coping mechanism, but I wanted to feel desirable. That's when I met Derek. Derek was an unassuming, average guy. He was cute enough, but not so attractive that I felt subconscious. Derek and I shared a few interests, craft beer, hiking, and he had a sense of humor that I liked. We agreed to meet up at a local restaurant, and I was so nervous. My first date in eight years. I donned my cutest dress, it got made up, and I headed out. As I waited in the restaurant, my palms were sweaty. My heart was fluttering, and I began to question myself. He arrived, and everything was awkward at first. We ordered our first beers and started to break the ice. As soon as the buzz of the alcohol began to hit, our conversation took off. We had relaxed in each other's company, and the rest of the date went smoothly. We joked about karaoke across town. He laughed about how he didn't like karaoke. I'm a huge fan of karaoke, while no superstar, I have spent a good amount of time in choirs and can carry a tune well enough. One of my favorite rowdy weekend activities is going to that bar and busting out some songs with the sweet taste of gin on my tongue. I convinced him to go with me, and we left at the restaurant. We sang into the night, taking shots, flirting, laughing. We ended the night in his truck clumsily fumbling with each other's buttons and zippers, hearts racing with excitement. This had been what I needed. We texted back and forth more often and soon, we were talking about another date. I had enjoyed our first time together and like that, I didn't feel a deep connection with him. It was fun and that was it. Because my heart was entangled up in feelings, he felt safe. We decided for our second date that we would go tubing down a river that runs through our town. We had parked his orange truck at the end of the tubing run and took the tubes and my truck upriver. We agreed that he would zip my truck key with his into a pocket on his shorts and that he would drop me off in my truck afterwards. Bright summer heat warmed our skin and the water felt crisp and fresh on our toes. The afternoon slipped past as we floated down the river. When we reached the bottom, we deflated our tubes and headed back to my truck. Only when Derek reached into his pocket, his face sank. He looked at me and said, Your key's gone. I laughed, surely he was joking, but he insisted it wasn't a joke. Gravity pulled on my stomach and I began to panic. This was the only copy of my truck key, and I had taken it on the river. I felt foolish and worried about how I would get a new key if we couldn't find it. The river was long and we had been tubing for hours. We had stopped at several places to swim. He offered to drive me home and I accepted. During the drive, we made a plan to meet up the next day to search for my key at some of these stops that we had made. 
and we spent the next afternoon combing our swimming holes from Ikea. Up and down we swam with very little hope that we would ever see my keys again. We had to try though, and we kept at it. From one spot to another, we drove, we swam, and we moved on. At the very last place we checked, as the light of afternoon faded into a hazy orange, something caught his eye. Underwater near the shore were my keys. We were elated, and we couldn't believe our luck. To celebrate, we went back to his place for some drinks. He drove me down a long wooded driveway, and at the very end was a shaded trailer. He told me that he was only renting a room here from an elderly couple, but they were on vacation so we would be alone. We walked over the creaking porch and entered the trailer. Inside, I could see the kitchen was messy. Not just a couple of dishes, but every surface was covered with mess. He ushered me away to show me his room. It was small and not very clean either. Dirty clothes, a mattress on the floor, a rubbermaid bin with some snacks like Doritos and cheap warm beer. We had sex, the yellow light of the trailer accentuating these stains in the walls. Afterwards, the spark of fun I had felt when we first met had withered. I felt gross. I decided that that would be our last date. A week passed and we hardly texted. Our brief fling was ending and I didn't expect to see him again. My mind moved on to other things. In the coming weekend, my friends were coming to town and I was excited. We made plans to go to karaoke together on Saturday night. When the day arrived, I was surprised to see a text from Derek on my phone. Are you going to karaoke tonight? It read. I responded that I was, and he texted back that he would be there. I thought you didn't like karaoke, I asked him, and he said that he had been invited by a girl that he worked with, and thought that he should give me a heads up that he would be there with a date, in case that I was there. I thanked him for taking the time to let me know, reassured him that I wouldn't be bothered at all and said that I hoped he had a great date. Around 9.30pm that night, my friends and I arrived at the bar. The dim lights and reflective foil stars an all too familiar scene. We got our drinks and picked a booth with a good view of the stage. I had a strange sensation like someone was watching me. I turned my head, scanning the bar and our eyes locked. Derek and his date were a few booths away and he was watching us. He waved zealously and with a big smile. His date turned around to look, and I managed an awkward wave. I was absolutely fine with him being on a date, but I didn't want to advertise that we knew each other or to make his date uncomfortable. My friends were all aware of the time that we had spent together, my thoughts on the experience, and the text that he had sent me earlier. We were all thinking it was a bit odd that he would go out of his way to interact with me in front of his date, but no harm, no foul. He was just being friendly. The evening carried on and we all had a great time, basking in the atmosphere, drinking in these songs and laughter. A couple of hours in, we were sitting in our booth when Derek stumbled over to our table with his date. He introduced her as Kate and plopped down beside me, pulling her down into our booth next to him. The strong smell of alcohol oozed off of them and I could see that they were hammered. It became obvious that they both had too much to drink. Their eyes glazed and their words slurred. Kate seemed really nice despite her state, and she launched into a drunk story to the whole table. My friends and I were fairly uncomfortable and we were unsure of what was going on. Under the table, I felt Derek's sticky hand slide onto my thigh. His date was right there and I was stunned. Without making a scene, I subtly removed his hand and excused myself to get another drink. As I walked across the room, I could feel his eyes raking my back and sure enough, when I turned around he was watching. When I got back, Kate was slurring that her taxi had come. She and Derek exchanged a sloppy kiss and goodnight, and then it was just us and Derek. Derek's mood shifted after that. He was drunkenly unaware of how uncomfortable the table was, and we could tell that he was brooding about his date having left without him. So, Derek turned his attention to me. He slung his heavy arm over my shoulder and leaned in, his sour breath managing to come together to form clumsy sentences. 
You're so cute. I love your laugh. I was rigid and just wanted him to leave. When he got up to get another beer, my friends and I spoke about the situation, one of them remarking, You know you can do better than this, right? I said that yes, as casual as this had been, I had made a mistake. We came to the conclusion it would be best if we ended the night early, as we didn't see him leaving me alone. As a backup plan, if anything went south, we agreed that the girls would go to the bathroom and leave out the back door, while our male friend would distract him and slip away. Derek arrived back at the table, sloshing his beer onto his front. He slurred. Where are we going next? I hesitated, but my friend told him that we would all be going home. Derek said that he would walk us there and we politely declined. He was leaning up against the wall and barely holding himself up at this point. We asked how he was going to get home and if we could call him a cab. Derek drunkenly potted that he could just come to my place with me. Trying to shut him down as politely as I could, I told him that my child was there with a the sitter, so I couldn't have him over. He didn't need to know that that wasn't true. He refused to taxi and said that he would just sleep in his truck. Since his eyelids were drooping and looking at the rest of his state, it seemed reasonable that he would be able to fall asleep in the truck, and we accepted that answer. As we started to leave, he stumbled after us. We stopped and reminded him that we were going to bed. He argued again that he should come with me. My friends and I locked eyes. It was time to engage with our backup plan. The two girls and I excused ourselves to the washroom while our friend distracted him. Slipping out the back door, the cool rush of night air hit us, and we hurried to the path that led to their hotel. Our friend caught up with us and said that he had left Derek behind at the bar. We were all relieved to be out of there and started to walk back to their hotel. One of the girls was sober and offered to drive me home when we got to the hotel and I accepted. A few minutes down the path, my phone began to ring. I looked at the caller ID and felt my stomach drop. It was Derek. I turned the volume down and let it ring and to my surprise he left a voicemail. I turned on the speaker and I played it out loud. Derek's voice sounded confused as his words melted together into the phone. Where are you guys? I thought we were going to hang out. I don't understand. We were all glad that we had left and agreed that this had been wild. And that's when the phone rang again. Another voicemail popped up on my screen. In the dim light of the trail, I played the new voicemail aloud once more. His drunken speech was more intense this time as he launched into how he didn't understand why I left. I had hurt his feelings and he was in love with me. The tone of his voice shook me when I heard him say, I love you. There was something dark and heavy about that which left me feeling unsettled. We were all creeped out but happy to see the bright sun of the hotel ahead. We traveled the carpeted hallway to the room so my friend could grab her keys to take me home. As we entered the room, my phone began to ring again. This time, the voicemail sent shockwaves of fear through my body. Derek's voice had taken on an edge as he repeated that he loved me, but he was actually really freaking mad at me for leaving him at the bar. He went on about how I could do that to him. He didn't know what was going on. His voice shook with anger as he stumbled over himself expressing how I betrayed him. The last thing he said before hanging up echoed in the hotel room. You know, I'm really starting to freaking hate you. This guy was unhinged and I was terrified. I was grateful the sight of Derek hadn't shown up when we were alone in his secluded trailer. My friends gave me a hug and told me to call them if I needed anything and to keep them updated. My friend took me home and as I unlocked the door and stepped into the comfort of my home, I felt exhausted. It had not been the night out that I had expected, and Derek's erratic behavior had really freaked me out. Fresh out of an abusive relationship, his actions at the bar, then the voicemails rang some all too familiar bells. And that's when I saw the headlights. It was very late for anyone to be driving down my street. I peeked through the curtain. My blood ran cold and trembled. 
Sitting in the cab of his orange truck was Derek. Mind racing, I panicked. This dude could barely hold himself up when we left. He was blackout, obliterated. How did he drive across town to my house? How did he find me? I immediately remembered the other week when he dropped me off after my key was lost. How could I have been so stupid? I barely knew him and we only had met three times. Derek's face was stony and etched with rage as he sat in the dark cab staring at my house. He wasn't getting out. He was just staring while I was on my hands and knees peeking out the window. All the lights were off inside. I was sure that he couldn't see me. And then the screen on my phone lit up. He was calling me again. I quickly hit it so he wouldn't see the light. Hands shaking, I played the voicemail as quietly as I could. Derek only said one thing this time. A phrase that sent terror shooting at my spine. In a drunken, sing-song voice, almost taunting me, he quietly said, Where are you? Click. I was terrified. Somehow, I hadn't really considered I could be in danger, and chalked up all the fear to my past experiences. Surely I was overreacting, and it was my fault for reading too much into this. I shouldn't be this scared and I don't want to make a scene. But that last voicemail sealed the deal. I figured even if I was overreacting, at the very least he was a drunk driver. I called 911 and the dispatcher said someone would be there in a couple of minutes. As I peeked out the window, I saw him get out of his truck. He was all done waiting. His heavy feet stumbled as they hit the pavement and he looked around. Derek's voice had cut through the night and he started yelling my name. The wild anger in his voice was tangible through the walls, and he just yelled into the street. Where are you? Derek started to stumble towards my house, when the flashing red and blue lights cascaded down the street, lighting up his face and highlighting every ounce of rage carved into his features. Two police cars pulled up and the officers got out. I was still peeking out from inside my dark house, and I couldn't hear much of what was happening. I watched them breathalyze him, which he obviously failed. The officers inspected his truck. They all spoke for a while, and one of the officers came to my door. I spoke to him about what had happened, and he was very apathetic. He said as unsettling as his actions could have been, there wasn't much they could do without a direct threat. The officer let me know that they would be taking him in for the night, and that he would be charged with drunk driving, but that he would be out tomorrow, and to make sure that I kept my doors locked and stayed safe. The tow truck came to remove his orange truck from the road, and I could see him arguing. The officers weren't having any of it, and they turned him around to cuff him. As the handcuffs locked around his wrist, he yelled out one last thing looking directly at the window that I was peeking out. I know you're in there. Why don't you come out to say goodnight? As quickly as my street had filled up, it was empty. The quiet shadows of late night swallowing the earlier chaos into nothingness. Derek texted me the next afternoon. I'm sorry about last night. I was in a bad place. I responded that his actions were unacceptable. And how dare he show up at the house that my child lives at, and that I would not prefer to hear from him again. He apologized one last time, and I haven't heard from him since. Over the next few months, I would see him on a bike going to and from his workplace, so I know that he lost his license. I was always worried that we would bump into each other, which thankfully never happened. I can only imagine how much anger he was after the night lost him his license. I found out that he had moved to the mainland a while back, which was quite a relief for me, and I no longer feel as on edge around town. So Derek, I hope I never see you again, man. So, I had met a guy online, and we talked for a day or two, but I was at the tail end of my degree, and things were getting to be a lot. So, I decided no dating until I was done. I let the handful of guys that seemed nice know before deleting the dating app, so they would know why I deleted it, and wouldn't think that I had ghosted because of them. 
He happened to be online when I sent it and said that I seem cool, can we keep in touch? Sure, no worries, and I added him on Facebook. Maybe once a week he's like, hey, how are you? What are you up to? Just normal conversation stuff. I would chat about university, work, the gym, whatever. After maybe two to three months, he's like, hey, we've been chatting for a bit. Let's grab coffee. I'm like, yeah, sure. He seems nice enough. I reiterated it would be his friends and that was fine with him. I was about to head into exams, so we made plans for in three weeks' time after I had finished them. He had started messaging me more and more regularly after making plans, more than once a day, and he starts calling it a date, which people call catching up a coffee date without it meaning an actual date, but I wanted to make sure that we were still on the same page, so I just said, hey, you keep calling it a date. Just making sure that we're clear, it's just a catch-up as friends. He snapped. He was sending me all sorts of horrible things on Facebook, so I block him. I had given him my number so we could make plans. So he started calling and calling, leaving voicemails. It was late, so I put my phone on silent and I went to sleep. The next morning, I wake up to 37 missed calls and voicemails between 10pm, continuing until 4am as well as a multitude of horrible texts. Now, this was seven years ago, when you couldn't just block someone on a phone. At first, I thought if I ignored him, he would get bored. After about a week, he wasn't slowing down, with dozens of calls a day. I called my phone company to get him blocked, and they said that you can only block three people, are you sure? I had to jump through all the hoops, and then they turned around and said that they couldn't do it. So, I would have to call the police. So, I called the police and they say that I have to call the phone company, but I can make a statement of harassment in case he does something more. Three weeks later, he's still going strong, but in his text, he starts saying he's going to force me to go on a date with him, and that I won't have a choice and blah blah. And then he starts saying that if I won't come to him, he'll come to me, and is telling me my schedule with where I will be at any given time which he put together based on our weekly conversations about normal stuff, threatening to come to where I'll be. I had to stop doing my regular activities and pretty much become a hermit. He ended up making a threat to my life. I can't remember what he said word for word, but it was essentially, girls like you get what they deserve, or something like that. But more clearly threatening, he would be the one to make it happen. I contacted the police again. And that was enough for an RVO, and I never heard from him again. Oh, and I was 20. But his pictures looked younger, so I didn't realize online, but it turned out this guy was 34. So, this wasn't dumb young kid behavior. This was a grown man. I've had many other psychos since this guy, but I'm very grateful phones have since allowed you to block anyone, anytime. A little background. I grew up in my teens in a big city. Because of abuse, I was hypersexualized but refrained out of fear. If it matters, I'm a white male. While in junior high, I had a few friends but was not shy or reclusive, just an average boogerhead. While outside on lunch break, I was walking by the monkey bars. A couple of girls were sitting on the chin up bars off to the side. As I passed, one of the girls started talking to me. Just normal questions, who are you, what grade, your age, etc. One of the girls made the spin, down or they slept. Anyway, she was hanging upside down by one knee. She had locked her other leg in a similar position and turned loose with her hands. Her skirt slid down right over her head. She was fully exposed since her bra didn't fit right. Everyone was laughing and looked, but no one was helping and no one noticed the tissue that I could plainly see. I grabbed her shirt and pulled it up to cover her, helped her to get down and walked with her to the building. I figured, good deed done, not quite. After school, she was waiting for me. She gave me a hug and then kissed me on the mouth. I pulled back because I didn't know this person and I didn't want to get involved. I guess she thought I was offended and she asked me, what's wrong? 
I told her that no, it wasn't a problem being kissed, and she asked what the problem was. I truthfully told her that I did not remember her name, and I didn't know her. She laughed and said, Letitia. We said goodbye and I went and caught the bus. The following Monday, Letitia is waiting for me at lunch. She tells me that she never did thank me for saving her. I told her not to worry about it, it's cool. We walked around the soccer field and then she stops me with her hand and says, My mom wants to meet you. I asked her why and she tells me that she told her mom what had happened and how she wants to meet me. She goes on to say, She's picking me up so you can meet her then. And we go back to our classes. I never was academically inclined, so now the dang day would just not move along. School ends and after dragging my butt, I meet Letitia. We walk to the parking lot and she gets all happy and says, Oh, there's my mom. We walk over and her mom gets out of the car and gives me a hug. I'm internally losing it. She says how good it is to meet me, how nice I was to have been there for her daughter, and then she says, You should come over for dinner. Um, what are you talking about? I start making excuses about how my parents don't like me out on school nights, and she says, Oh, don't worry, it's all taken care of. I already called your mother. Dinner tomorrow night at 6. They get in their car and I get on the bus, cussing phone books. Mother, why did you say yes? She replies that it will do me good to meet other people and girls. I had visions of telling her, oh, that I've met her all right. I've seen some stuff too. We even tongue wrestled. The next day just stings. It takes forever and at the same time, it jerks forward at warp speed. Lunch break truly sucked. Letitia told everyone that I was going to her house for dinner. Oh, and to meet my dad. I was seriously freaking out. I walk back to the building and spend the rest of the school day planning my getaway while answering questions about dinner. What's for dinner? The day ends without me having a plan. She walks me to the bus since her mom isn't there yet. And then she kisses me again and the bus driver was watching too. I get home, say not one word to anyone and go to my room. My mom pops her head in and tells me to change for my date and goes back to where the hell she came from. She drives me over and says that they'll bring me home. No, you come and get me. I don't know these people. I don't know why I'm going, why I was invited or anything. You should come get me mom or I'm not going. She agrees and tells the teacher's mother that she'll pick me up. They agreed on a time and my mom leaves. I meet her three brothers, her two sisters, a cousin, and her grandmother. Everyone was cool. Well, one brother kept giving me the stink eye, but there's nothing I can do, so I ignored it. I thought maybe, just maybe, I could hang out with the three brothers, even the one with the stink eye, but that didn't happen. I ended up there sitting next to grandma, which was cool because Letitia was hovering. After about 15 minutes of nothing, her dad comes home, and this man is huge. He steps up to me as I stand, I thought about running, and he smothers my hand in his. He says, So, you're the boy who was seen and rescued my daughter. I stood there and thought that I was going to pass out. He asked me a couple of questions that I just nodded or shook my head to. My mind is screaming at me to talk. He says, take a seat, and I did. He spoke for a while, telling me that relationships were difficult at best. I can feel my neck twisting around to look at Letitia, while he says that at most, you can expect a little hostility. She walks over and sits above me on the arm of the couch. I'm looking at her dad and then her, over and over again. She reaches out and takes my hand. I finally find my words and whisper, What did you tell them? She laughed and said, just that we were girlfriend and boyfriend. I didn't mention the other thing we did. No, oh, heck no, I'm thinking. You kissed me. Do you think that she whispered this and not a chance? Her dad stops talking and is just looking at us. Her grandmother, having sat right there the whole time, turns and adjusts her seat on the couch so she too can look at us. I'm turning red, embarrassed, yes, but I'm getting upset. 
Her dad says, What thing? I told him, She kissed me. It came out as an accusation. He looks at me and then looks at her. He takes a deep, slow breath and says, Well, maybe you two will make it. When the two of you are old enough, and if you still want to, I'll give you my blessing. Blessing for what, I say. He says, You'll marry my daughter. I'm stunned. I'm having a major brain fart. I snap out of it when she starts sliding on the arm like she's going to land on me. I popped up and ran out the door. Forget being picked up. I'm running home. I eventually get home to an empty house. I go to my room and lay on the bed. The phone rings. I go into the kitchen and answer it and it's my neighbor. He asks if I'm okay and I say that I am. He tells me that my mom is out driving the street looking for me. She got a call that I had left in a rush and everyone was worried. I said that I was fine and I hung up. I turned on a lamp in the living room to show that someone was home and I went to bed. The phone rings again, but I return to the kitchen and answer. You will marry my daughter. It was her dad. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing the phone games again. Sir, I wouldn't marry your daughter for anything, he says. You will marry her, I said. I don't know what she's told you. I don't know if she is as crazy as you are, but I am not repeat. Not marrying her or anyone else. I helped her and she kissed me. I don't even know her name. We are not dating and we have never dated and we never will. He got quiet for a bit, then he said, Is what you just said is true? I replied, every word. He tells me to watch out for his sons until he can collect them. And then he hangs up. Brothers, son of a gun. The brothers then announce themselves with a pounding on the door. Oh, it's the whole family. They are totally not. I start gearing up with multiple sweaters and two pairs of blue jeans. I get my bat ready and I walk into the living room. I look out the bay window. They're still there. I look at my dad's gun rack, but I don't grab one. I know they're loaded. I do mentally select the weapon I will use if everything goes left. The banging is stopped, and I look out the window again. The neighbor is talking to the brothers. While I watch, first my mom pulls into the driveway, and then their father pulls up. My mom goes and talks to them. I can picture her telling them to all come in. After a minute or two, she comes in. Are you okay? Mom, was this some kind of joke or prank? Please say yes. She walks over and hugs me and says, No. Son, you did a good thing at school. Don't let this stop you from doing the right thing. She continued. I'm sorry, I had no idea. I went to my room where I just sat there. I don't even remember what I was thinking. To this day, almost 40 years later, I just shake my head when this memory returns. I was about 13 or 14 and I was babysitting two boys for some church members. I had done it before and the kids had loved me and the parents were very comfortable with me. This was a night where they were going to be gone for pretty much until like 2.30 in the morning. I was doing it for free that day because they were going to do something church related and that's just how I rolled. Anyway, the house they lived in was an apartment complex. You know, one of those small ones that had two floors and four places in each spot. They're on the bottom floor with two bedrooms on either side of the apartment, with the kitchen on the left, and the living room on the right, with the sliding glass door to a small patio, and a public bathroom next to the front door. It was about, I think, 1.30 and I knew they would be getting home soon. The kids were conked out. Obviously, after practically begging and three bedtime stories, and I had finished my homework and they didn't have cable. This was before Netflix was ever a thing. So, they had a couple of DVDs and VHSs to watch, so I grabbed Land Before Time to make the night go quicker. I was already very tired and I had nodded off a couple times. At about two, I could hear knocking on the front door. Knowing the parents had a key, I did nothing but sit there in the dark with the TV glowing. Being a paranoid person and who watches and reads enough horror, I grabbed the baseball bat that was next to the couch. 
and what happened next will haunt me forever. I heard a small voice, almost like a young woman's. Oh dear, that won't help you now. My heart stopped, and I realized the patio door didn't have the blind shut. My eyes shift slowly to the door and I see someone on the patio staring in. I couldn't make out anything other than that they were very short and wide. I screamed and ran into the kids' room. Thankfully, they were all still asleep. Sadly, this was before I had a cell phone, and there were no cordless phones. All I did was push the dresser in front of the door and stared out of the one window of the room. That's when it became dark as a shadow loomed on the window. The knocking started again, and the woman's voice called out, Oh, come on, dearie. I won't hurt you. Please come out. The window was being knocked on so hard that I was afraid it would break. The kids finally woke up and they were all screaming and they were really scared. I was a big girl and could at that time lift my own weight. But knowing that I had two kids with me, I became very vulnerable and afraid. Within two seconds, I hear the father yell out, Hey, who the heck are you? And the person on the porch ran off. The front door opened, and there was a harsh knocking on the kids' bedroom door. Thankfully, it was the parents, and after I let them in and put the dresser back, I explained what had happened, and they called the police. When they arrived, they obviously found nothing but the bushes that tied the patio. They were obviously cut up and ripped up to get through. I babysat for them once more after that, but after they moved away about five months later, I never babysat anyone ever again. And again to this day, I know the woman was long gone, but every time I hear a knock, a chill just runs through me. It's been about 11 years. It was autumn and nighttime, and I decided to take a little walk around our housing estate with my dog, Sunny. Sunny is a black and big Labrador mix. She is really good and cuddly, but she hates other female dogs. She also has a strong protective instinct and always snarls when she doesn't know or doesn't like someone or something. There were no streetlights inside the settlement. The only lighting was always at the house entrances. There is a small park with small playgrounds between the row of houses, but as already mentioned, everything was in complete darkness. That's why Sunny was not to be seen, only to be heard now and then when she was chasing a rabbit into the bushes. And then it goes without saying that she wasn't on a leash. I only need this when other female dogs are nearby. Sunny listens to my word and always comes when I call her. So, when I strode comfortably through the dark settlement and froze my butt off, Sunny ran happily through the area and the bushes. I always only guessed where she was, because I could not see her, only heard her from time to time. At some point, I noticed a small shadow that was whizzing around me. When I looked more closely, I could see Sunny. She ran in large circles around me in the place where I was and I thought that she was chasing something. But the circles she drew grew smaller and smaller. She didn't make any noise and I went on comfortably because I thought she was having her five minutes. At some point, I didn't see her anymore, but I went on knowing that she would follow. And then I heard a sound, footsteps, but they weren't my own. I was startled because they were so close behind me so suddenly and so I turned around but couldn't see anything thanks to the darkness. I got nervous and called for Sunny because it could have been someone with a dog. Sunny didn't come and I easily panicked. She suddenly stood in front of me out of nowhere and began to growl as violently as she had never done before. My blood froze because it couldn't be a good thing. And then she started walking straight ahead, growling about two or three meters. Stopped and at that moment I recognized a figure, completely in black. The person was shocked in front of Sunny and didn't move and Sunny started barking like there was a no tomorrow. This person slowly walked backwards toward the lighted house entrances 
and then I saw Sonny bare teeth in front of a young man, wearing a hooded sweatshirt, and probably started to experience these same fears as I did when I noticed him. Because as close as he had snuck up on me, he couldn't have had any good in mind. Since it was too dark, however, he could not see Sonny and she must have surprised him at the right moment. Sonny started to jump and at that moment, the guy let out a scream and you could hear something falling from his hand on the floor. He ran and my dog followed. After I had released myself from my shock stiffness, I called out to Sonny as loud as I could, until after a short time, she was standing in front of me again, wagging her tail. I took her on the leash and then went to where the guy had dropped something and indeed, there was an arm-thick branch on the floor that he certainly didn't have with him to throw sticks. At home, it gradually dawned on me that my Sonny did not have her five minutes when she had circled me, but that she had long since noticed and kept an eye on this piece of crap to protect me. On the one hand, that was creepy but also a relief. I was and still am so grateful for this great dog.